And I want to start here. And I just want to declare to you that we are in a season, and I heard this uh, again tonight, and I heard this yesterday when I was writing a letter to our, well, two days ago when I was writing a letter to our partners. We're in a season of unprecedented visitation from the Lord. I'll try over here. It, it, it's, <laughs> I'm going to give you 100% tonight. <laughs> And uh, I really am. I'm going to give you everything the Lord gives me. But your positioning is going to determine what you receive tonight. So we're in a, a season of unprecedented visitation. And then I heard this phrase this afternoon in my hotel room. God's people will decide if it becomes a habitation. And I just want to tell you what I saw tonight. I saw the most beautiful different angels tonight. And... Uh, Angels, we don't obviously worship them, but they're sent as ministering spirits. And your ability to cooperate with the unseen realm, which is more real than what you see. Everything you see in the seen realm has been defined by something you cannot see. Yourself included. We'll talk about that more tonight, hopefully. Your life is defined by what's on the inside of you. Much of uh, our challenge sometimes is, is in this world system which the enemy really likes to train us in. And I, I've learned that uh, perhaps the number one tool against the people of God is ignorance. And, and then the creation of doctrines in the name of God that would keep people back from God's fullness of what they would experience. But there was beautiful angels in this room tonight. There was, there was songs that God wanted God's people to capture. There was um, uh, wisdom and understanding. And uh, the, the, the angels are sent as ministering spirits. So often they come and they enable that to happen, but it's the responsibility of God's people to lean in to receive that. And often t sometimes it, it, it in this sort of teaching, often sometimes people shy against or uh, they, they have trouble with because it makes them responsible for, for what they're going to receive from God. Now, God's completely done everything he can do for you to get born again. You can't save yourself, but you'll have to agree with his provision for him to save you. So we believe that. I don't believe people just arbitrarily get born again. I mean, you can if you want to. I think it's a, actually a very cruel doctrine to believe that God picks certain people and there's nothing you can do to save yourself. One thing you can do is just agree with God by faith. So you have to agree with God to receive salvation. He's done everything he can do. God has, God has done everything he could do to save everyone in Augusta, Georgia. God never sends anyone to hell. Maybe you're like, how can I? Loving God send people to hell. It's actually, the, the premise of the question is wrong. God never sent anyone to hell. This day I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. You can feel, I always feel God's passion when you say that. He's like, I'd really like you to choose life, but you get to choose. And so, there are these realities available to the people of God in this season. And this is a season of unprecedented visitation for the people of God. And God's people will decide if it becomes a habitation. And hopefully this will make uh, clear, uh, hopefully we'll, <laughs> this will make clear as we go on tonight. But look at uh, John chapter 1. It's very interesting. Hope you brought your Bibles tonight. Bibles, iPads iPhones. <clears throat> if you would start in verse 19, this is very interesting to me. It's always, it's been sticking out to me for a number of years now. Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then are you? Elijah. He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And then, he said, then they said to him, who are you that we may give answer to those who sent us? 
and what do you say about yourself? And he said, I, I am the voice of, and of course we know Isaiah prophesied about him. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord as a prophet Isaiah said. So this is very interesting. John says, my mission is to make way the, the, the path of the Lord, to make way the straight of the Lord, to allow the coming of the kingdom or the coming of the Messiah who's going to preach the message of the kingdom. And we know this is very interesting about John's ministry. John's ministry did not have miracles to it. And we know this is what he taught. He taught repentance. Repentance is a change in thinking. So he is saying, my job is to proclaim a change in thinking for the people of God, because in the change in thinking, it actually prepares the way for the coming of the Lord. So I want to submit to you that, you, that it is in the coming of the Lord, the, the breaking free, what we're praying, like, hallelujah, like, come Holy Spirit, all this stuff, all the good stuff we pray has fundamentally to do with your mindset and your ability to com continually change the way you process reality. To think like him is actually makes the coming of the Lord possible in the measure he'd like to come. The forerunner message, often taught to if it's applicable, the forerunner message, make way the straight of the Lord, has to do with the mindset of God's people. So he's saying there's a dysfunction in the mindset of God's people that only a changed thought process can bring the coming of the Lord. And then I want to go to December uh, the 27th, uh, 2022, just before the year, uh, the year began. Uh, I put this, uh, it's on our, the whole words on our website or the compilation, but I want to read this tonight. Uh, of what the Lord said about this coming season or this coming year. I, I, I think God thinks more than seasons. It says, there is a clear call and the voice of the Lord is speaking plainly and clearly to his people. This is December the 27th. It is a call to come close. It is a call to come near. And, and me, uh, when the Lord speaks to me, and I'm just writing it down, I always have these questions. So like in my mind, I go, how do I do that? And then he said, where is your heart located? And he said, the center. He said, am I the center of all things in your life? It's a call for some of my people to redefine their lives and even the dimension in which they have seen themselves in light of who I've desired them to become. I'm calling my people to inherit what no other generation has inherited before. Uh, before. I'm calling my people. Now, listen, this is really important. There's a theme that God is speaking tonight. I'm calling my people to position their hearts and their minds to obey what they know so they can inherit what is not known but will fulfill promises given to many of my children many years ago. I have sensed that for a number of years now that we are living in the answer to other people's prayers. Listen, my people. An Abner translation is, listen to me, Linda. Listen, my people, now is not a time to grow weary in well-doing. Now is not a time to shrink back. Now is not the time to lose heart. For 2023 will be the great unveiling and the great unpacking to my people of divine inheritance. Divine inheritance is your portion and generational building is what many are stepping into in this season. If they will simply, and I kept hearing, obey, obey, obey. Be aware be aware and be sober-minded that the enemy of your soul seeks to steal the prophetic destiny for which you've been put on the earth. Now is a season in which he desires to steal the prophetic purpose I have, any of, I have for any of my children and abort that which I've ordained to birth in this season. So I say again, do not grow weary in well-doing. You know, the interesting thing about ignorance is the enemy is unrelenting in speaking ignorance. And so he'll continue to speak it because his hope is that you would give up before the manifestation of what God desires to give you comes. 
And then this is, uh, I felt the part that we would focus here tonight, at least for the next few hours. This is a season of a call to maturity. This really jumped out to me uh, this afternoon. This is a season of a call to maturity. So we want to make a few statements if we want to be uh, mature people that I think are important to the, the backdrop of what the Lord would have us uh, look at tonight. Habitation is God's desire to bring the corporate man into a place of normalcy. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not God's goal. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to get us to a place of normalcy. So it's amazing, right? Like, like if, if you realize the, the profound dysfunction sometimes, and, and I love the body of Christ, and it's, it's God doesn't have any other plan, but it's so amazing to me that when God does certain things, uh, people cling on to dysfunction because they're more used to that than actually what God considers normal. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is to bring us into a place of normalcy. And he said to me this afternoon, the corporate man. And then uh, this, it's in the environment of habitation that God desires and does desire for discipleship to take place. It should be normal that the glory of the Lord is in your midst. It should be normal to have the glory of the Lord be in your home. It should be normal, these sort of things, that you, you, you know that there's an abiding presence. And, and, and that's, not, that's not the high point, though. The high point is that just it keeps increasing. The high point is that it keeps increasing, but the goal of God is to teach you out of that environment. Out of that environment, that's what God wants to do. And then we'll follow up with this, is that we know that it's uh, God's vision for our lives and for every person in this room is not to get you to heaven. God's vision for your life is to make you like Jesus. That's right. God's vision for your life is not to get you to heaven, is to make you like Jesus. Heaven becomes the inheritance of becoming like Jesus. In fact, you never hear actually Jesus ever referring going to heaven because heaven was never the goal for man. The earth was the goal. Be ye therefore imitators of Jesus. And then Luke 8. So a beautiful thing about the corporate body. This is, there's some beautiful things about God. I think, I think that's probably why he gave us tongues because uh, sometimes words aren't fully adequate to describe how awesome God is, you know. <laughs> really, you know. Uh, but the corporate people, which is tonight, and, and you know that God only has like one, when he, if you see when Paul writes letters, he writes letters to the churches in that city, not one individual group in that city. So he, when God looks at a city or a region, though there might be an expression from maybe a word of faith background, an expression from a Pentecostal background, an expression from a Baptist background, and I'm, I'm all of them. I am. I'm all of them. I'm Baptist because I believe you need to dunk them. I do. I'm Episcopalian because I believe in taking communion every day. Take it every day. You know, my Catholic friends are like, you can't do that. You're not, you're not a priest. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> <You know. laughs> I'm Pentecostal because I believe you all should speak in tongues every day. I'm Vineyard because I believe everyone, everyone gets to do the stuff like Wimber taught us. Everyone gets to hear the voice of God, lay hands on the sick and cast them out, devils. Yeah, that's right. Everyone gets to do the stuff. I'm Catholic because I believe in the Holy Universal Catholic Church. That's right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm word of faith because Paul said it is the word of faith which we preach. That's what he said. It wasn't Brother Hagin who taught prosperity. It was God's idea, Genesis chapter 1. Amen. You know? So I love the beauty, but when you, there's different expressions and different tents, but there's only one church in the city. So he says when he writes a letter, he writes it to the, church, to the church in Ephesus, not to the Word of Faith church. 
Not to the Presbyterian church, not to the Lutheran church. He writes it to the church in the city. So we could be, all have different places where God's called us to be. But we are all part of, it, 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 and what qualifies something to be a local body? What qualifies it is if God called it to start. That's what called it. Did God birth it? It could meet, it could meet in a house, and if God said do it, then it's part of the local expression in the earth. But you don't do it because you're mad because they didn't give you a platform. <laughs> you shouldn't do it because you had a little different doctrine. You shouldn't do it because it's a good idea. You know, here's a really important principle to remember in life. I think about it often is, um, I was thinking about this like right before the year, that if, if you get hired to bake a red velvet cake, Tommy. It's New Year's Day. They hired you to bake a red velvet cake. And you show up the day that that cake is due for that party that you've been hired to do, and you show up with a chocolate cake. Now, the chocolate cake is the greatest chocolate cake you've ever seen in your life. Fudge, I don't know, it's really good. It's good stuff. And you don't know why they're mad that you didn't bring the red velvet cake. You're like, I had good reason. I love the Lord. <laughs> you don't get credit for good things. You only get credit for what he asked you to do. So you could have great motivation. Like, I have good motivation. I got to talk about your motivation. You could be motivated and stupid. <laughs> no, it's really true. No, really, I'm being really, like, we, well, we want to help people, so we started this ministry. Did God tell you to do it? Sometimes there, there is a need, and that moves you. I'm not discounting that, and, that and, and God's in that need. But often, much of, anyway, I'll just leave that alone. But remember that you only, you only get credit, in a sense, and you get, and here's the other thing about God, hopefully we'll touch about more tonight. You also will be judged by the motivation by which you did it. I had a friend, uh, Ken Peters, he's gone on to be with the Lord. He said something very sobering to me in our friendship. He said, the Lord told me the first three years of my ministry will not last into eternity because I did it with wrong motives. So Luke chapter, four, chapter 6 verse 40 says this, students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained, who is fully trained will become like the teacher it is only the corporate man and this is why the enemy fights it so let me go back to that. i didn't finish that point we're all hopefully on this journey to be like jesus that's why the, the body is such a beautiful thing because hopefully you go well i heard the lord say this and 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 i'm sh showing this oh really the lord showed me this and, and hopefully you grow together you know i believe hopefully when you you know Westerners, we gather at least once a week. It doesn't have to be a prophet that you hear from, but you should hear a prophetic message. You're like, oh, I was walking through this, and then suddenly, shebang, your senior leader is teaching about that on a Sunday. That's why you don't miss. That's why you need to be committed. Consistency, persistence, and intentionality are all characteristics of disciples. But it's, it, we're all supposed to be like each other, but we're all uniquely different in that expression to the world. And that's why the enemy fights the corporate man. But it's only the corporate man that can govern regions, cities, and nations. Now, I want to look at this here. I want to look at God's original intent for uh, a few reasons here, because I want to look at this concept of the heart. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, if you would. Verse 26, reading out the New Living Translation tonight, at least these series of verses. Then God said, let us make man in our image. So man was made in the likeness, resemblance, pattern. Some translations of image there is shadow. Adam was, and Adam and Eve were to be a shadow of God, not a little God. But if you were to see Adam 
operating or functioning as God intended, you could see who God was. Uh, common question, actually I think is healthy, I don't think all questions are, but good question that often uh, you hear maybe from unbelievers. They said, what, how do you prove the existence of God? That's just a great question. How do you prove the existence of God? Well, a believer's life is supposed to be proving the existence of God. You know, he came up with these like intellectuals and said, yeah, oh, God is everywhere. Oh, that's all true. It's just not a good answer. Your life is supposed to prove the existence of God because you're made in the image of God. You're made like God and you're made in some ways to operate like God. God is inside out and he's made you to operate inside out. Notice it says to be like us and they will reign. Over the fish of the sea, or the birds of the air, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth. So another way you're made is to have authority. And often that's hard for us to hear because even as believers, because many of the examples that we're used to of someone functioning in authority is, uh, is distorted. But you also notice here, it doesn't give you, he doesn't give us authority over other people. It's over all the earth. They will reign. So actually, power is something that should be attractive to an unbeliever. Power in the sense that you are not defined by difficulty. You are not defined by whatever challenge that comes your way. You actually have the ability to reign over every challenge that comes because you walk with the God who has all the solutions to it. Amen. You'll see Jesus models this in Luke, the fifth chapter. No fish, I'll get you fish. And that became attractive that they were not at the, at the whim of everything that happened in their life. So that also takes out this little thing. Everything that happens in your life is not God. Amen. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, small birds scurrying along the ground. So God created human being in his own image. Again, he reemphasizes that. In the image of God, he created them. Notice he, he, he emphasizes as well, Genesis 1, when time began, God. God is always the source of creation, and God always wanted to be man's source, your source. Male and female, he created them. He created them. Uh, but before we go on there, it's very, very interesting. You'll see, he tells them to reign in the earth. And then he makes man and woman. So one of the ways that God wants believers to reign in the earth, by the way, everything you see here in Genesis 1 is all connected to what Jesus modeled on the earth and then what he reintroduced to humanity. And nowhere in those verses you'll ever find uh, Jesus uh, or, or God saying in Genesis 1, which is book of beginnings, book of original origin, uh, uh, I like the, the best phrase I know for it is his divine design. This is his divine design. You don't ever see God saying, I came to set up a religion called Christianity. He came to set up a kingdom here. Now, the kingdom of God is not a place. The kingdom of God is a way of living on the earth that was supposed to model, that was supposed to actually bring God's world of heaven to the earth and make heaven like earth. Heaven was supposed to, uh, earth was supposed to be a colony of heaven. So you'll notice he gives them governing authority to reign over all the earth. And then he creates male and female. What is he doing? He's establishing, obviously, roles, but he's also establishing the family. He's saying a family, men and women, united with each other, is one of the foundations by which you can rule and reign in the earth. You'll also see that they were supposed to reproduce. We'll touch on this in a minute. One of, the, one of the, the, the distortions, and you still see it in society today, is you were made to be made in the image of God, but as your parents reproduce, you're also made in the image of your parents. 
So your parents were supposed to be the face of God in your life. And so these are influencings based on whether you had those good experiences, whether they were in your life, out of your life, all those ways, you were missing something. Now, God can redeem it, but it's important to point out that you were missing something. And this is why I even encourage even single moms like, or dads, whatever I tell them, you can't be the woman. Like, I'm a mom and a dad. You're actually not. <laughs> it's impossible. Just like it's impossible to have a trans woman or a trans man. It's important always to be biblically correct. So the point of that is, is I, I, years ago, uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot of pictures of my dad as a child, uh, but because he grew up in Cuba, he escaped from Cuba. Um, he, no one's trying to get in for their free health care. <laughs> Amazingly, when the government says they're going to be your source of all things, they can't take care of everyone. Shockingly. <laughs> but I don't have a lot of things from his upbringing. But years ago, I, I got an uh, email from the farm he grew up. It was like a black and white photo, I remember. It was a little, when, you know, things took a little while down, though, so I'm watching it. And he never told me which one was his. He was about four or five years old. He never told me which one was his. I didn't need to. He didn't need to tell me. I knew exactly which one was my dad. Not my dad, but I'm made in his image. I have his DNA on the inside of him. So... I point these out because these are all influences. And at the top of this, I failed to say that human beings, even though they were created to be perfect, were created for transformation. Human beings were made for transformation. Human beings were made for transformation. That's why even today, some of the most popular billion dollar industry is the self-help industry and often what you'll find is biblical principles without God at the the center but themselves at the center themselves as the God but it produces certain things because they actually apply different biblical principles without God at the middle. 